We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. I mean, no one plans to get sick, and yet, here we are. My name is Matthew Zachary. I survived cancer, a stroke, and COVID-19, and somehow, I'm still here. I also survived our stupid broken healthcare system, and I want to help you survive it too. So let's go make healthcare suck less together. Because you know what? We're all out of patience. Hey, that's the name of the show. All right, welcome back to Out of Patience. As usual, a quick reminder before we get started, please check out our groundbreaking documentary series, The Cancer Mavericks, a 50-year history of cancer advocacy since the National Cancer Act of 1971. You don't want to miss it. Cancer Mavericks, anywhere you listen to your podcast. Check it out. On the show today, we have the cutest couple on Instagram, says me, David and Robin Dubin. I go way back with these two to the pre-internet stone age of cancer advocacy. I'm talking life with DSL. DSL! Dave is a two-time dad and a three-time colon cancer survivor. He received his first cancer diagnosis at the age of 29 and discovered then that he had Lynch syndrome. Heard of it? Me neither. Actually, I have because I know David. But they're trying to change all that because Lynch syndrome is a genetic precondition to cancer That affects one out of every 279 people. I don't do math, but that's a lot. And most people don't even know that they have it. So they found it alive and kicking. Now, there's no vowel in kicking. It's K-I-C-K-N. They were ahead of the curve between Lyft and all the other non-vowel companies. They educate the public about Lynch syndrome and support those living with it. So we're going to talk about survivorship and pre-vivorship. Yeah, that's the word and what it was like to test their sons for the Lynch syndrome gene. Here are David and Robin Dubin live in studio to gripe, quetch, inspire, educate, and talk all things Lynch syndrome and how it's actually possible to not get cancer because genetics are the new prevention. Enjoy the show. All right, listeners, David and Robin and I go back through the chain. This is a Wayback Machine episode like the Live Strong days, the early young adult cancer, yeah. pre-colorectal cancer alliance stuff, around around there. that time, some yeah, somewhere. Was it there. was it Bush or Obama? That's how we define when we met each other. <laughs> it was Bush. It was okay. definitely Bush. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. I was I was in Vegas the last year you did the stupid cancer thing in Vegas. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. yeah. we had a lot of fun at those events. We had both had a full head of hair at the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I've seen your wedding photos. <laughs> I missed that mullet. Yeah, I know. I didn't have a mullet. I had a Jufro. Well, yeah, it was was pretty much the same thing. No, it was a yeah. mullet. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were the first people I had met in this notion of, is it possible to not get cancer as opposed to preventing cancer? And this idea that you can have something before it gets worse to something terrible, yeah, right? Like precursor. And I was like, that's an interesting way to think about try to not get cancer because you have a really acute symptom of getting cancer. Cancer. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Am I am I making this too? No, no, no. no well, because, the, the uh, term is is previvor. Yeah. It is is really the term that has come from this. It's it's essentially knowing you have the genetic mutation, but you have not had cancer yet. But chances are the, the right. percentages are very high that you will. So our oldest son, Zach, is um 
25 and he had genetic testing when he turned 18. So he um, has the gene, um, but he's known as a previvor because he Who has- Who invented that word? I, I kind of like really it, sure. but I'm on the fence. I think it came from the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer world because their genetic research on that hereditary uh, cancer gene syndrome, it goes back as far or further than the research on Lynch syndrome, but um, it's having a genetic predisposition to high risks of certain types of cancers. So why did he have this test in the first place? Because it's a 50-50 chance that you hand it down to the next generation. Oh, so you're saying that it's your fault. I say that everything is my fault. Okay. (laughs) You know I wake up every morning and apologize. (laughs) It's like a bank account. Because you're a husband or because you're my friend? Yes. Fantastic. Yes, it's just easier. So you have Lynch syndrome. I do. Let's establish that for the listeners. Yes. Kind of a fun fact of the day to know, at least. Otherwise, you're subjecting your son to some random test that makes no sense. Which is fun as a parent. Yes. But in this case, it's actually warranted. So this is a situation where you knew in advance... By having children, you could pass this down to them. Some people do. Not everybody knows that they have, like, we didn't know he had the Lynch, carried the Lynch gene. Yeah, his fault, not yours. When we had our kids. Um, So he had colon cancer the first time at 29 years old, but it was 1997. And no one was talking about genetics. Clinton cancer, like me. (laughs) Clinton cancer. Uh, So nobody was talking about genetics. So we knew there was a family history because his father and his grandfather had had colon cancer, but no one said anything. And it wasn't until 2007, 10 years later, when he was diagnosed with his second colon cancer that they started asking about genetics. And that's when he got genetic testing done. And we learned about Lynch syndrome, which we had never heard of. And we really, it took us a while to process and understand what it meant not just for him, but for our children. And because by then we had three kids. So um, that's one of the reasons we actually started Alive and Kickin' was because we looked around and we couldn't find any resources, education or support for the patients in this community if they even knew they had this gene. Right. And just for context, this is like pre-internet too. So yeah. So not like you can just pop on... Yes. TikTok or LinkedIn or Facebook and find your family. Right. Didn't exist at all. Al Gore had not invented the internet yet. I mean, it was kind of sort of invented. I remember the AOL CDs, right? Were were we in like CD (laughs) land or DVD land by then? I think we were still on the floppy disk. Floppy? (laughs) Which is what I'm I'm very fond of saying that. (laughs) I just, I still find it funny that the the save button on your computer is still a disk. Yeah. That, like, does way, anyone that, know what that means anymore? No. I just did a show with Steve Friedman. If you remember Steve Friedman, he was part of the Live Strong and the Omen Fund way back in the day. He had testicular cancer in 95. Right. And he found, get this, an AOL group with a dial-up, like from the floppy disks mm-hmm. of testicular cancer patients on AOL in the 90s. I'm yeah. like, you're the one. Yeah. You're the only one who found cancer support on AOL in the 90s. But you're talking Lynch, you know, right. that's like, that, that doesn't even sound bad. Well, that's because no one's heard of it and right. no one knows what it is. And what would you prefer it be called? Like Lynch lemonade. I'm thinking like, you know, like it doesn't, <laughs> well, or, or the bad version of Lynch, which we don't use anymore in society because right. we've right. ideally evolved as a species. Originally it was, it was known as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. So I'm going to go with way too many syllables. Right. Right. It, it got cut down. It got became an acronym, HNPCC. And for the most part, that's no longer used as well. Right. So they ended up changing the name to Lynch syndrome, named after Henry Lynch, mm-hmm. who is kind of li- considered the father of hereditary cancer. And um, he passed away a year or two ago. Um, he did a lot of Lynch syndrome and hereditary cancer research out of Creighton University. And for many, many years, so. Did you realize when you started Alive and Kicking that you would set off a 20-year trend of dropping vowels? <laughs> yes. Because it's K-I-C-K. Mm. Yeah, that was, yes. that was the internet again because right. we couldn't find the domain name. <laughs> the domain was taken. Right. <laughs> Aliveandkicking.com was taken in 2007? Yeah. Now that's innovation. I think it was a few years later. I yeah. think we, I think it was like 2011 when we really got the nonprofit going. Because like, was it Lyft, 
you know, um, I don't know, like every single company now has no vowels. We've <laughs> lost the need for vowels. Yes. But everybody well, spells it wrong all the time it, anyway yeah. now. You need like aliveandkick.com, aliveandkicking.co. Can we just go with what we have? How about Dubin and Dubin? <laughs> okay. I would go to that law firm. I think there is one. They have the domain then. Right, they do. Probably. They, they probably own Alive and Kicking. All right, so you did what kind of I did, what we all kind of did in the 2000s. We tried to build a community that we wished we had. Right. What was the initial reaction response? Well, it, initially, we kind of got lumped in the colon cancer world simply because I had had colon cancer twice. You know, we appreciated that, but we wanted to separate ourselves and really focus on the genetic component and, and Lynch syndrome specifically because there was a need. And the more that we learned about it, the more we realized the statistics were really, really kind of staggering as to the number of Lynch syndrome patients that were out there. And, you know, even still the percentage that they don't know about it. Right. And this goes back to the famous word awareness, right? How do you know you have this? You were unique in the sense that you were woke enough to say, oh, could I possibly endear my children with this fabulous genetic trait? Does that happen frequently? Or is your community people who don't know they have Lynch and find out about it or it's too late? Work me through the algorithm of human awareness. So in terms of people kind of finding the patient community, finding Alive and Kickin', right now, the majority of genetic testing is still happening with a cancer diagnosis, especially if it's um, early onset, someone younger in the family, and then the conversations within the family and with their uh, providers are starting to happen about family history of cancer. And often it takes that f for the doctors to put it together that there may be something genetic and they get referred to genetic counseling and genetic testing. And then if someone does test positive, then they encourage the rest of the family. So that's when you'll have people who end up getting tested and find out they have the gene before they have cancer. But um, in the medical community, it's not really talked about enough. Uh, primary care providers don't really spend a lot of time taking family history, especially family history of cancer. So um, patients aren't being referred to genetic counseling if they suspect they have a hereditary cancer gene in their family um, often enough. And right now, the, the statistics are that one in 279 individuals has a Lynch mutation, and over 95% of them don't know it. I mean, I guess that makes sense for all the wrong reasons. Right. I would argue that, you know, you have a captivated audience of family members if someone in that family right. gets colon cancer, but how do you potentially ethereally reach people that don't know they're at risk right. or don't know that they had a family history or have no family history? What would incentivize a GI doctor if you're just going for a regular checkup to test you for this? Well, I, th I think a GI doctor has an incentive to do so, and, and same with the uh, the OBGYN community, uh, because these are, well, f for a number of reasons. One is they're seeing they're seeing people at the right time to have these type of conversations. Most people don't go to the GI doctor unless there's a reason, uh, and obviously on an OBGYN is, is a different story. But um, you have the right people and the right audience at the right time for those two types of specialists who have this type of conversation regarding hereditary cancer and potential predispositions. Um, but you are right in that knowing your family history is still the biggest issue. And it wasn't that long ago that people passed away of stomach aches. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, people would, people didn't talk about cancer. And EMRs uh, were mostly paper and, and scribble and not necessarily uh, any type of data that could be extracted. And even still now, it's, it's still not great. You have this whole storm of, of issues that is really keeping people from thinking about this, which is what we're trying to accomplish is getting the word out to the general public about this, that this exists. It should be talked about. And, and realistically, uh, you should be doing something about it so that you can prevent having cancer or if, if you do have the predisposition, catching it at a very early stage. The other thing is it's not just high risk of colon cancer. For women, they have up to a 60% lifetime risk of endometrial cancer. 
increased risks of almost everything in the GI, urological, and reproductive tracts. So um, you talked about incentivizing doctors. Lynch patients have a huge um, array of annual cancer screenings. So, you know, NCCN guidelines recommend that Lynch patients... Hang on. Jargon alert. NCCN is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Continue. Okay. So the NCCN guidelines for the management of Lynch syndrome patients recommend a colonoscopy every one to two years, starting in 20s and 30s, depending on which Lynch gene you have. So that means that in someone's lifetime, they're going to have dozens of colonoscopies uh, versus you know, having your first colonoscopy at 45 now and one every five to 10 years. So how what number are you up to now? How long have we been married? <laughs> Is it like a chalk outline on the wall of a prison? Right. Balloons came from the ceiling the last time. <laughs> <laughs> I get a mug. No, I think I'm at number 27 colonoscopies right. and I get an upper and a lower with anesthesia, which is a GI doctor's dream. I mean, let's be honest, this is still a reimbursement world, and a Lynch patient is going to be there pretty much on the dot every year. And if they're not, their their spouse is going to make sure they're going to be there. And then, of course, then the, the kids and whoever else is related to them that potentially has the mutation, I hate to say it, but we're good patients for a doctor. By the way, it, going back to one of the original things you said was uh, about getting the boys tested, uh, our middle son tested negative which means he's essentially as normal a child as I could produce. <laughs> uh, but Fair. Right. But he does not have the Lynch gene. He does not have MLH1 mutation, which means he theoretically should not need to go to a GI doctor until he turns 45 as well. So, again, it's the proverbial coin flip and 50-50 chance. All right, let's take a break, and we'll come back right after this. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Have you guys had a chance to listen to the Cancer Mavericks series? Briefly. A little bit. That's decent enough of an answer. <laughs> so the, what I've discovered in going through this process is that so few of us who've been working our fucking asses off for 10, 20 years don't know, for no wrong reason, what the hell had to happen in the 60s, the 70s, and even the 80s to get us to the point where we can complain about things where you kind of don't die right away. How do you feel about that? We, we're not dying right away. I mean, again, with an asterisk, there's always bell curve and full empathy. By the way, this show is not pro-death. We want people to live a happy, healthy life. But in the 60s, 70s, it kind of just died. And now we're here trying to not get it because we have the opportunity to, I hate the word prevent because it just means like, there's no chance in hell you can ever get it is prevent, but try to not get it. <laughs> Right. It's actually something, uh, if it's okay just to deviate specifically towards Lynch, this mutation the or these sets of mutation started hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Oh, wait, you didn't start it? I did start it. <laughs> um, it's all tape. It's it is fault. my fault. Um, I started it thousands of years ago. Um, I was around with, uh, with Noah. Anyway, uh, I digress. But you, you think about this. I had colon cancer at 29, and obviously I'm now, I'm now here at 54. How did people do this back then? I mean, you, you had to theoretically reproduce in your teens in order to produce enough kids so that the 50-50 chance, you know, it was, it was not passed on to certain ones. And, and it's a real fun thing to think about from a mathematical standpoint is, is how we got here. It's wild. We know a lot of people in the community whose you look at their family history, and it's really 
it's so upsetting to see how many of their relatives they've lost to early cancers due to Lynch syndrome, colon and demetrial and 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 it isn't till the last few years that any of the doctors put that together to the point where they could have the genetic testing and know. And there's there are preventative things right now. Also part of the NCCN guidelines for women with Lynch syndrome is once they're uh, past childbearing years is to have prophylactic hysterectomy and oophorectomies to prevent endometrial and ovarian cancer. That's another running joke we used to have. Maybe they still do at Super Cancer is how many things can you live without? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like operation. Like what parts can they take out and then what cancers can you still get? Right. Right. Because you still can get blood cancer. Like, you yeah. need blood. Yeah. You need blood. You, you need your blood. Right. So you're always at risk for hematologic somethings. But what can you actually remove to not right. get cancer? I, maybe it's not that funny. But it's I just funny. think it's, it's, a, it's like it whack-a-mole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you, he's got, you know, like, he likes to talk about having 18 inches of colon left. I'm very and proud of it. 90% of his right kidney. By the way, he's wearing a T-shirt right now that says, colons are for losers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's true. Yeah. Colons but, are overrated. But there are conversations in the community about whether having a total colectomy is something that that is recommended or not, or some people, has, their physicians do recommend that. And even, even um, Dave's oncologist has brought up the idea that at some point he should have the rest of his colon removed. Yeah, but it's that balance between lifestyle, uh, or I'll say living, because we're very fond of the concept of living with cancer, because you know it, it, you want to do it the right way. If you but also do something it. inconceivable in the 1990s, 80s, and 70s. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, is l- not only living, but living, but thriving. And, yeah. and it's not an easy scenario. And uh, my oncologist, her job is to make sure that whatever happens, uh, if I develop cancer again, uh, she finds it early and that's her job. So we talk right. about it and I have no problem with it. Um, my answer right now is no. But you've also spent, I mean, this isn't your day job. Alive and Kicking has been this thing that you started. It grew a life of its own. You've been managing it too, Robin, as a co-founder. But you spent a decade or more in genetics and genomic companies and precision medicine. And what have you observed? Like what, what is new? What matters today? Well, what matters today is really analyzing cancer, tumors specifically, and knowing everything about what is involved with that cancer so you can treat it appropriately. So open question, kind of a subjective question. What is it going to take to guarantee everyone who enters the I hope I don't have cancer store to be told there's a test for you to see if we can possibly stave off the cancer you might get one day? It, think, it's a combination. I right. mean, there's a, there's a, it's, it's got a number of components to it. It is obviously knowing what is going on in your own body previously. So it's sequencing your germline, whether it's whole exome or whole genome, is analyzing you before cancer. And who does that? A lot of companies do that. How do people know about those companies? They have to look into them. Right. right. So who's their advocate if they're not proactively moxie-ridden mm-hmm. like we are? They're well, doctors. They're doctors, but it, 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 uh, I don't want to open up the can of worms, but you know, there's the balance between the clinical world and the insurance world. When we, our oldest had his genetic testing done, we did not get life insurance for him ahead of time. We should have for obvious mm-hmm. reasons because he came back positive. So it wasn't until the second one came along and he had his genetic testing done that we got life insurance for both of them. So the older one who tested positive, his life insurance is through the roof. The middle one who had not gotten tested yet could have been 50 50 his life insurance policy was like half right. uh, if not Cost less than, than than the older one you know subsequently he tested negative so we don't even need it um but y- y- you get my point right so you have this balance now so let's say i'm i'm, I'm a 20 something uh and potentially looking to have a family in the future male or female um and i decide i, w- I want to get myself sequenced great what happens if i come back positive for something if i have some sort of mutation it's going to ding me on my ins- in my insurance world. So th- there's got to be a real systematic mind shift if you're going to look at preventing not just cancer, uh, a lot of things that take place genetically. Your point is well taken in the sense that, A, do I even want to know, first and foremost, because most people just don't want to know, see no evil, hear no evil. 
if they're at risk, they may be more predisposed to want to know because clearly they saw what might have happened to a family member. But at the same time, are people aware that, yes, if you get into an accident, your, your premiums go up. But if you're tested for something that puts you at risk for something and your premiums go up, where does that fall? Is that fair? Because you're trying to be proactive right. for your health. Exactly. And by staving off something, you're eventually saving money down the road of an insurance company. Agreed. The other thing is, and I mean, we're talking about life insurance here because health insurance is protected under the GINA Act. Right. Um, which is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which was signed in 2008 by George Bush. It prevents discrimination for genetic conditions uh, for health insurance, but it does not cover life or long-term care or disability insurance. But there are studies that show that if people are aware that they have this uh, predisposition to cancer and they get their appropriate screenings, that they live a lot longer. So for life insurance companies, you would think that um, if there's this family history that that they would want people to know because they can be proactive in their care. They can get all the screenings they need. And you can see it demonstrated in family trees. Once the family knows about this genetic condition and they are more proactive and they're getting their screenings that very few family members end up dying from cancer. Well, it's like, think of how much money is saved down the road by not getting cancer. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, a stage by four far. cancer diagnosis is much more expensive than the, you know, years of annual screenings that you have to get. Not to mention how it actually impacts <laughs> someone's life, <Right. laughs> you know? Right. But also, like, if you're younger, like you were in the, young, in the Gen X millennial sect, it gives you that many more years of economic productivity to the right. country. Yep. You're not dealing with stuff. You can go back to work. You can have children. You can yeah. pay a billion bucks to send them to college. Right. <laughs> which we are. Yes, which I will be doing in about six years. We're looking forward to you doing it. Which is terrifying. Yeah. Yes. There's also a lot of things now, too, that impact especially the Lynch community in terms of research and um, advancements in treatment. So um, Lynch syndrome patients primarily have what are called MSI high tumors, microsatellite and stable tumors. And um, immunotherapy is extremely effective on MSI high tumors. So it's very, very important to know if you have Lynch, uh, if you are diagnosed with cancer, because it can impact your treatment plans. Because Lynch patients do much, much better on immunotherapy than a chemo. and um, Which is also cheaper. Right. And has less side effects yeah. and things yeah. like that. So um, so is the moral of the story to anyone in this space, like if you have a family member who had cancer, you might be at risk for the same or a variant of that cancer. There's a test that you can check right. to, today, tomorrow, ask you, talk to your doctor about my uncle had cancer. Will I have cancer? Yes, yes. absolutely. It's that that's, simple. Th yeah, yes. that, and that's one of our biggest takeaways all the time when we're out there talking to people in the general public is know your family history, talk to your doctors about your family history, ask about being referred to genetic counselors for genetic testing and go from there. So that's the main focus. If, if someone you know in your family has had cancer, you should get checked because you might be at risk for the same cancer. If that's 80%, 20% is, hey, general public, you might be at risk for cancer, but you don't know it. Go ask your doctor anyway. Your uh, first point was um, about if, if a family member had cancer, the recommendation would be to have that person who had the cancer get checked first. You know, you'll have a, a younger person develop colon cancer, and they'll have germline testing, hereditary cancer testing, and it'll come back negative. Boy, so just because someone in your family had cancer doesn't mean you might be predisposed to it. They would have to have some kind of genetic trigger in their body that you might have in your body. Correct. Okay. Right. And the other thing is there's some exciting research going on into vaccines for Lynch syndrome patients. That's a trending word these days. Isn't it? <laughs> it's a good word. It, these are really good vaccines, but it's just in the beginning of phase one clinical trials for a vaccine that can actually keep Lynch syndrome patients from developing cancer. Again, back to our theme of the show, it's easier than ever to not get cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. What's your website? 
So it's aliveandkicking.org. It's spelled A-L-I-V-E-A-N-D-K-I-C-K-N. N for no vowels. N for no vowels. <laughs> Live and King. We'll put a link in the episode description for sure and yes. throw it up on all the social channels when, when we promote. Uh, I, I love that I know you guys. It's, <laughs> we've been on such a fucking hell of a journey all yep. these years and we're we're still here. Still here. David Dubin is the founder and chief patient advocate at Alive and Kicking, vice president of strategic account management at Karis Life Sciences. Robin Dubin is the co-founder and executive director of Alive and Kicking and a venture partner at the Cancer Fund, which I want to have you back on the show to talk about. Sure. Thank you for coming on Out of Patience. Our pleasure. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. If you like today's show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Brianna Seeley, Jen Oranja, and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seeley. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. <laughs> <laughs>